You may be seated. <clears throat> the early missionary and church planter, Lutheran church planter in North America, a man named Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, wrote in his journal on September 6th, 1777. Today I am 66 years old and I'm entering upon my 67th year. This summer I beheld a scene at my small dwelling place. A scrawny, unattractive hen, or pullet, laid 11 eggs in a hidden place amid a great cackling. For several weeks the hen sat on the eggs, suffering hunger and thirst and hardly taking a few minutes during the day to search for food in order to preserve life. Finally, the little creature came out and brought 11 chicks to my door and asked for feed for her helpless offspring. She broke the bread for her young ones, warmed them at her breast, protected them against storms, warned them when she spied a bird of prey from afar, drew them after her when they wished to stray, fought men and strong beasts who approached too near to her young ones, cut a figure with her wings as if she were wearing a hoop skirt, and brought her young ones to my door or under my window five or six times a day and asked me to feed them. When the young ones had grown enough to help themselves, there was not one among them which showed enough gratitude to bring the mother a kernel of corn or share a chance crumb. Moreover, the mother ceased calling them became quiet, modest, shy, and timid, and withdrew into solitude. Let the application be made to poor, aged parents and preachers, children and congregations. What I don't know about chickens could fill a library. I've seen them, I've fed them, I've, I've cooked them. I can, I can cut them apart if somebody else takes care of cutting off the head and plucking the feathers. <laughs> I, can, I can take it from there. But I don't know anything about how chickens live, how they get by. And so whenever we get this passage, whenever I hear these words from Luke's Gospel today, I think of that journal entry by old Pastor Muhlenberg way back in the 18th century. Today's gospel uh, in includes that very vivid and very memorable image in which Jesus says that he longs, he has longed to gather up the children of Jerusalem as a hen gathers her brood to her breast. And this is a, a, a powerful image because it is so tender and affectionate. This image of the hen and her chicks. And also because it is a, a rather refreshing variation on the heavily male language, the male parental language we get for God in most of the scriptures. Scriptures do not depict God in exclusively male language and metaphors. There is a lot of feminine grammar and terminology for God, but the preponderance, the majority of it is, is sort of male-centered, and so it's very, it's very kind of refreshing and powerful to get an image of God that comes, um, that comes from a different direction. And that reminds us that our own ideas about gender and gender roles have changed through time and that human beings can kind of take on different roles and so can God uh, and that the vastness of God is so great that all manner of human and natural experiences get refracted through it. However, however, the, the import, the meaning of this passage today is, is not primarily about how wonderful it is that Jesus wishes to be a mother hen. In fact, this image, this image of, of a hen gathering her brood under her wings 
has a very heavy, shadowed side. If we look at the context, we are in a, a kind of dramatic and intense moment. And if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been jumping around in the chronology of Jesus' life, like, like a movie where there's time cuts, you know, going back and forth. So two weeks ago, we were in chapter 9. Jesus is gathering a large movement to himself. He's on the mountaintop with, with Moses and Elijah and his closest disciples and the voice of God and all that. Then last week, we jump all the way back five chapters to Jesus being tempted in the wilderness when he has no followers, when no one knows who he is except the devil. Well, today, we've gone nine chapters back into the future, chapter 13 in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus is turning his path toward Jerusalem. And the size and the diversity and the unknown quality of his movement, his body of followers, is raising political problems. And so in this, in this moment, the Pharisees come to Jesus. And very often, especially in Matthew's Gospel, the Pharisees are depicted as being this kind of mortal enemy of Jesus and his followers, um, as if the whole world is divided between Jesus and the Pharisees. But but in reality, Jesus' followers and the Pharisees were very closely related in a world that, that really took very little note of them and, and didn't agree with them about anything important. So the, the battles between Jesus' followers and the Pharisees are more like squabbles among cousins. And so the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're trying to warn him. They say, look, Jesus, Herod is trying to kill you. You better go away. And Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. I want you to remember that image of the fox when you hear about the hen here in a minute, okay? Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. On the third day, I finish my work. But I will be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is preparing the people for what will happen and where it will take place. And this is where he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it, how often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. That is where the power in this gospel resides. This is not a story about how wonderful it is to experience the maternal love of God. This is a story about how costly it is for God to love with the love of a mother. Because what do you do what happens if you refuse to be gathered under the wings of the mother hen? What happens if we persist in our errors? What happens if we are obstinate in our wrongs? What happens if we steadfastly reject the good and embrace what is bad? This is not a story of assurance. This is a story about love's cost. And to hear that more clearly, I'm going to ask you to take a look back at the reading from Genesis, which is a very strange and confusing reading, but it's, it's important because it takes us all the way back, 18 centuries perhaps, before the time of Jesus, all the way back to the very early days of God's covenant with the people who will become Israel. And here in the 15th chapter of Genesis, it is a covenant that God has made with one person. And that one person is named Abram. He hasn't even gotten his new name from God yet. He's still just Abram. And God has promised him land, and God has promised him descendants, and yet Abram has no children. And he complains to God, look, you know, um, 
the heir of my house is, is uh, you know, not my own child. A slave born in my house is to be my heir. But God assures him and sends him outside and says, count the stars if you can. That's how many your offspring are going to be. You have to picture an extremely dark night. Like, think about the world before electricity, right? Okay? So, so you can see a lot more stars than, than we can, we've ever seen in our lives. And Abram believes him. Abram believes him. And God counts that belief to him as if it were righteousness. God treats that belief as righteousness. It's a very important moment for us Lutherans. God, God reckons, God, God regards Abram's faith as righteousness. And then God decides to ratify this promise. God decides to make a, a ritual sealing this covenant and so he tells Abram to, to take a, a heifer, a three-year-old heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And the, 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 the cattle, he, he uh, slaughters and cuts in half. And the, the birds remain intact. And he, and he chases away the birds of prey. And I'm sure Abram at this point is thinking, what is going on? Why, why did I do this? I could have used those, those cattle. And then he falls into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness settles on Abram. The darkness of God kind of descends on him and, and takes him beyond his own understanding. And he sees in this dream, in this vision, he sees a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing between the halves of the animals. And then he wakes up. And what has happened here is that God has made a treaty with Abram. In the ancient Near East, this was a ritual that sealed a covenant or a treaty between two kings. And the weaker king, while making a promise of being a vassal or of providing service to a stronger king, would, would sacrifice the animals, divide them in two, and pass between them on his way to the stronger king, as if to say, should I fail to, fu to fulfill my promises to you, may this be done also to me. And so today, in this story, God is approaching Abram in, in the role of the, of the weaker party. To the covenant. God is saying to Abram, should I fail to deliver on my promise? Should I fail to keep my promise of descendants and a place for you to be buried? May this be done also to me. The God of the scriptures would rather be torn in half then abandon those whom God loves. God would rather God's own self, God's own body, be divided in two than lose any whom God has called. That is the gentle yet fierce quality of God's love. That is the persistent and patient, but yet urgent love of God that will go to Jerusalem, that will go all the way, that will never stop trying to gather that brood under her wings, and that will never give up on nor abandon those whom God has called. Amen. Amen.